uh, this morning, and uh, hopefully you will not be uh, disappointed. I think we're going to have a discussion about something that probably many of us uh, just sort of overlook. It's sort of these base units of things that we uh, use every day, and that's how we're going to uh, irrigate uh, and treat these wounds, sort of like the, if you were making a soup, kind of the base the base broth uh, in, in, in wound healing and wound care, and is there any potential benefit uh, to, any of the, uh, to any of this? And it's my absolute pleasure uh, to, to introduce uh, Sam Kohanzadeh, uh, who uh, uh, trained in, uh, well, he went to undergrad here at UCLA, but uh, trained in plastics at UAB. He's back now home in the 310 on the west side, and also uh, working in uh, limb salvage uh, uh, here in town as well with uh, one of my former fellows. So. It's my absolute pleasure. Will you please help me welcome uh, Sam Kohanzadeh. Good morning, everybody. My name is Sam Kohanzadeh. I'm the Director of Plastic Surgery at Sherman Oaks. I'm going to be speaking about the cleansing, irrigating, debridement with Pearson, plus changing the wound bed prep paradigm. So the topics that we'll cover today... So the only thing that we know for sure that will continue is change. So with the changes in recent health care, the changes in government policy, as we all know, there's been a lot of significant change in health care these days. Next, we'll talk about resistance and readmissions to the hospital, hospital-acquired infections and infection control, and then a little bit about Pearson Plus, the science behind it, how it applies to what we're talking about and then the difference that innovation can make as the company behind Pearson. So these are some of the uncertainties that we face in the future. So wound care centers, emergency rooms serve as a large portal of entry for infections into the hospital facilities. So one of the greatest concentration of surgical sites is from these two portals. Every patient we see in the wound care clinic has a wound, otherwise they wouldn't be there. How can we reduce the length of stay for these patients? What are the ingredients that we can use to help improve their outcomes? How can we affect wound closure rates? What can we do overall to affect the balance of these patients? As of the beginning of the year, there were several new Q codes that came out for skin substitutes. Among that, we also have several new changes coming. What other new dressings are gonna come out this year? And then what are we going to do with ICD-10? So all of the uncertainties that we face. So a little bit about resistance and readmissions. There's an estimated 300 million patients that will die due to drug resistance in the next 35 years. Federal data actually shows that greater than 2 million Americans are infected with drug-resistant bacteria. And this is associated with 23,000 deaths. So, looking at infection, one in 25 hospital patients has at least one hospital-associated infection. Surgical site infections are the most common cause of these hospital-acquired infections. And these can double and sometimes even triple the cost of their care. What are our most likely culprits? C. diff, MRSA, Pseudomonas, Staph. And staff is actually associated with the three times the normal cost of hospital stay for these patients. A lot of hospitals now do tests for MRSA when patients are admitted, the nasal swabs, but many of these actually still go undetected. And most of us don't know, there's actually $4.8 billion spent on infection control and prevention. This is estimated to more than five or six times that value, 24.6 billion in 2018. So looking again at hospital-acquired infections, you can see surgical site infections have the largest piece of the pie, equal to that of pneumonia. So from 2010 to 2013, hospital-acquired infection rates actually had a 17% drop that's 1.3 million fewer associated infections and $12 billion reduction in cost. Why? This is mostly associated with central line associated infections. So there's almost half drop, so 50%. Pressure ulcers were the th third greatest reduction, 20%. 
but surgical site infections had a meager 19% reduction, the least improved, even though it was the greatest number of hospital-acquired infections associated with this. So that leaves a lot of room for us to improve. So like we had said, emergency rooms serve as a large portal of entry for all of these different infections, stab wounds, animal bites, open fractures, lacerations. So what are the current treatment paradigms for these? We irrigate it with saline. We irrigate with betadine, which is a cytotoxic solution. We prophylax them with antibiotics to try to prevent them from getting infected. And oftentimes, when they do end up being closed, it's performed in the emergency room in an unsterile environment. So what, what can we do to affect this? So let's talk about wound bed prep, like Dr. Armstrong said. Pearson Plus can help in this arena. It can help with infection control. It can help with resistance, readmission, and as a very good form of cost containment. So what's new in wound bed prep in the last five, ten years? Not much. That's why we're going to talk about Pearson Plus today. So Wolcott and Fletcher in 2014 discussed what would make the ideal solution for irrigation of wounds. It's something that does not impair normal wound healing, but at the same time has a good effect on bacteria and a good bactericidal effect. Hypochlorous solution represents this. It's non-toxic, but at the same time has a rapid antimicrobial action. So this is our friend, hypochlorous. In human biology, hypochlorous acid is the key ingredient that our body uses to fight off and kill bacteria. We're duplicating that process with Pearson Plus. So here we can see the effect of hypochlorous. It's the, pri the primary enzyme responsible for radical oxygen species production is a mitochondrial membrane bound enzyme, NADPH. And then during respiratory burst, neutrophils produce hydrogen peroxide, which is then converted into hypochlorous based on myeloperoxidase with the following e equations. So this diagram shows how we create the hypochlorous within the body to kill and attack bacteria. So why hypochlorous? It denatures the protein wall of the bacteria and then is able to enter into the injured bacterial cell, inhibiting DNA re replication and resulting in bacterial cell death. At the same time, the hypochlorous serves as a preservative for the solution. So when we talk about it in a little bit, it has a very long shelf life, even after opened, 12 months. So this chart, we can look at a little bit of the importance of pH. So hypochlorous acid and hypochlorite live in the same solution, based upon the pH determines which is more predominant. So if you shift the pH curve to the left or right, we get different concentrations of hypochlorous versus hypochlorite. Why hypochlorous? So hypochlorous acid and hypochlorite ion are formed from the byproducts of sodium hypochlorite in water. And as you can see below, there's the reaction that gives us hypochlorous acid and hypochlorite. So when we were talking about the pH, it's important because it determines the efficacy and the killing power of the solution. So hypochlorous acid actually reacts faster. It's 80 to 100 times more effective killing than hypochlorite. It does not evaporate and is non-corrosive. However, Cl2 is very explosive, and that's why we want to keep the ideal pH between 6 and 7, where there's actually no Cl2 at all in the solution. So this is going back to our talk about why hypochlorous acid versus hypochlorite. The bacterial cell wall is negatively charged. Hypochlorite is negatively charged. So they repel off each other, and that's why it has such a lower kill rate, whereas hypochlorous acid, neutrally charged, is able to easily penetrate the cell wall and cause cell death. So let's look at actual kill times for these three separate concentrated solutions. So hypochlorous acid, hypochlorite, <clears throat> and hydrogen peroxide. So three separate test organisms were used. 
they looked at a 90-minute period, and then we have the times listed there. So E. coli, Pseudomonas, and Staph. And hypochlorous acids, kill time is less than one minute for all of them. Whereas versus hypochlorite, you're going all the way to 20 minutes. And hydrogen peroxide, even after 90 minutes, it wasn't killing some of the organisms. Next, looking at NBC. So again, the same three organisms. Hypochlorous acid has the most effective killing potential. So this is another diagram looking at several other bacteria. So Klebsiella pneumonia, Enterococcus faecalis, <clears throat> MRSA, Staph epi. And then if we look at the far right column, you'll see the significant microbial reduction using puricin. So greater than 99.99%. So here are some of the products available on the market currently that use hypochlorous acid. So Puricin Plus at the top, Vosh, Microsyn, and Anicept, which I believe most of us are familiar with. But the thing to look at in this concentrated solutions is the amount of hypochlorous acid, now that we know it kills better than its cousin hypochlorite, and the highest concentrated solution with hypochlorous acid is Puricin. The others have more hypochlorite, and Anicept is actually no hypochlorous acid at all. And then if we look at the far right column where it talks about stability, we could see that effect of storage life and useful life greater than 12 months for most of these because of that effect of the hypochlorous acid. So Pearson Plus. Richard Branson talked about complexity being the enemy and that the key to making a good product is having it be simple. This is what Pearson represents. It's been approved for cleansing, irrigating, moistening, and debridement. The indications are listed here, but this is only part of the indications. I actually use it on cosmetic patients as well when they do skin resurfacing, laser treatments, and it has a significant effect on those as well. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But acute wounds, chronic wounds, full thickness wounds, burns, ulcers, surgical site wounds, graft sites, they can all be used and it has a significant effect for all of them. The safety. There's no drug or treatment interactions that anybody has proven or shown. No clinical contraindications. It's non-cytotoxic, non-irritating, and non-sensitizing. Additional testing has shown that it's safe for oral use. There's no ocular irritation and no genotoxicity. In terms of the oral toxicity, several of the reps actually use it to gargle their mouth. So Mike Nelson over there, Mike, raise your hand. Everybody can look to Mike. He can tell you about how it tastes. So again, the advantages of Pearson Plus. It's non-toxic and non-irritating. There's no steroids, no antibiotics within the solution. There's no alcohol or iodine. There's no mixing or diluting required. It reduces wound odor, cleans the wound bed without harming healthy tissue, and it's environmentally friendly, so there's no special disposal requirements. So like we said, like, Dr. like Richard Branson said, something simple. So for debridement, Pearson aids in mechanical removal by irrigation. It creates a moist environment by rehydrating the wound bed. And all of those together assist with sharp debridement. So the application guideline is similar like we do for any wound. So moistening the dressing helps remove. You let it sit on the wound for several minutes, irrigate the wound. I do it before and after any debridements that I'm performing. But this, this, all of us know how to do this part of it. Now, this is where innovation makes a difference as a company. They actually have an over-the-counter version of Pearson available as well. This is, this is at the stand in CVS. Other benefits of Pearson. It can be used with multiple modalities, with the wound vac, pulse lavage. I even use it to reconstitute my skin substitutes. So that way it has a prolonged diluting effect as it comes out within the wound. 
what kind of solutions is Pearson available in? So there's an ampule formula coming out. <clears throat> we already have the bottles available. Spike bottles are coming out, as well as liter bags for the operating room. And then newly coming out is also a hydrogel formulation. So I was very excited to have this one come out. So. And then the other difference that innovation makes is data behind their product. So they're actually very much in the forefront with prospective trials, randomized style trials, white papers, and working with partnerships with programs such as Wounded Warrior and Haiti. So some patient examples now. This is actually an 85-year-old male who presented to myself, malnourished, he's had a stroke, he's demented, he can't help himself, and he came in with these infected wounds. So obviously, first we started out by taking him to the operating room and debriding him. Once that was done, these are the measurements for our wounds. We went ahead and put wound vax on a couple of them and treated the rest and we began instituting therapy for him with regular cleansing with Pearson in addition to the wound vac therapy. So already over the course of a couple of months, the wounds are improving. And despite being readmitted to the hospital multiple times with UTIs and pneumonias, these wounds did not get infected one time. So we were able to get them to completely shrink down and then eventually place skin grafts on them. This is a gangrenous finger in an actually a 50-year-old male, bad diabetic, vasculopath. If you look closely, he actually has already lost two of his fingers on that hand. So he was very eager to try to maintain these finger. Multiple people had told him he needed an uh, amputation. But we gave him the benefit of the doubt, took him to the operating room, debrided the wound down to muscle, and down onto bone. So that's actually distal phalanx exposed distally. And with the help of Pearson, we were able to keep this wound clean. It did not get reinfected. We were able to place a skin stub substitute on it and get it to form a nice bed of granulation tissue. So, and this is with him going in and out of the nursing facility as well. As we all know, it's very hard to keep them clean there. This is a 92-year-old male with this squamous cell carcinoma on his forehead. They came in, he had a cellulitis, it was infected. It was not until it got infected that they decided maybe we need to take this out. <clears throat> so we ended up taking it out down onto skull. And as all of us know, that's not an easy thing to recover from. So that's a skin substitute with Puricin. Like I said, I rehydrate them with Puricin. So then over the course of the time with the vac on there, it helps elute the Pearson formula is the way I think about it in my head. And then over the course of actually, this is at two weeks out, we got a nice bit of granulation tissue. If you look, there's no more cellulitis around the edges of the wound, not a single bit of erythema, no more infection. And we went ahead and placed the skin graft actually on him yesterday. And then last, this is an example of a pressure sore. This patient did not have any skin substitute at all. This is purely with cleansing with Puricin to keep the wound clean. And as we know, that's a horrible area with feces coming out regularly, infecting the wounds. But this just shows the effect of Puricin in keeping wounds clean, allowing the body to heal itself. And so again, thank you everybody. I'm uh, again, we're part of the Amputation Prevention Center at Sherman Oaks. Thanks. Again, I tell you what, this, uh, th this mic, it must be me though. I think it's uh, I'm just electrically charged. Uh, but it, that was awesome, Sam. Uh, this uh, paper is now uh, open for uh, for questions. And uh, 
let, let me get started. I mean, I, I, I like what you're talking about with, with simplicity and, and because So, so let, let's just let's just Low take tech. that philosophy as you approach <laughs> no, as you approach a, a chronic wound now. Um, uh, you know, how are you doing that? Where where, where, you, where are you using uh, a, a, a you know, hypochlorous and then uh, and then where are you employing negative pressure? I think we got a pretty good philosophy based on what you're seeing, but let's work through that. So I use hypo, we use hypochlorous on everybody now in the clinic. So every patient as they come in, the nurses take off the wounds. They use the hypochlorous to help. Moisten the wounds. They leave it. They leave a gauze moistened with hypochlorous on the wound, Pearson Plus, until myself or any of the other physicians enter in to see the patient. Got it. We perform whatever debridement we think is necessary, just like normal. Mm -hmm. And then afterwards, we leave again Pearson on the wound for at least one minute. We actually have talked about it. The studies all show less than one minute for all that kill time. Even actually within 30 seconds, you get most of the effect. So if you're in a rush, 30 seconds, but if you can, a minute or two would be beneficial. And then the nurses come in and finish the dressing, whatever it may be. I use the wound vac therapy just like I did before. The only difference is now instead of irrigating with saline or something like that, we have Pearson that has that extra kill potential. So are you, and, and you say are you, you're using installation with... Uh... I do. Good, yeah. And so you just... Uh... Uh, leave it in your dwell time as you know. Uh, you, you just uh, put it in for your dwell time, and then you're uh, and, and you're using Puricin now and just hang in the bag. Which is and, and is there a spikeable uh, Puricin, or do you say that's in it's development? coming out soon? Got is it. Is what I've been told. Okay, both. Uh, well, well, terrific. The, and then the the other thing is, like when, so the, here's the other thing. In, in the OR, how are you using it? Say with uh, you know post skin graft. What's your protocol? Uh, a post skin graft. Are you throwing some white foam on top of your skin graft, uh, and then uh, vacuum that uh, for for a week, um, and and then where does hypochlorous come into play there, or does it? So what we in the in the OR setting with the new bags coming out, it would be the ideal setting instead of irrigating with whatever triple antibiotic solution, betadine so, solution that we have all talked about. We know the the toxic effects of it. Puricin would be perfect for that setting. So what we do is when we put like a skin graft, for example, we put the skin graft, we'll put an interface layer, like you said, put the wound back on, and then when they come back to the clinic, we take it off and we start again, like I said, with all the wounds. We put a dressing, a moist gauze with Puricin onto the wound, both the donor site as well as the recipient site. Excellent. And we clean with the Puricin, do whatever treatment we need to do, and then again, at the end, irrigate. You brought up a point about the uh, eluding into the wound. I actually, for my skin substitutes, when we use them, yeah. we rehydra rehydrate them with... Yeah, the I heard you talking about it. Yeah, so, you just, uh, so what were you using when you were talking about... Uh, I, was, I was looking at, like, uh, for instance, on the... So one, one example of what we... Epifix, for example. Uh -huh. The chorionic amniotics. Got it. yep. Yeah, it's, I will actually open the solution, pour the Pearson in, let it sit there for about a minute... It rehydrates, and then I can place it onto the wound. The thinking for me that way is that it's actually over the prolonged life of that graft yeah. is going to have Puricin in it. Well, I mean, I, I think you know, that would actually be interesting to, uh, I mean, to actually look at uh, its elution rate and kind of uh, yeah. and that curve over time. That would be something that would be relatively easy to do, I'm sure, mm -hmm. uh, uh, if, you, if, if you grab some. But that, no, that's, a, that's a, a, a clever idea. Uh, well, good morning to you. It's, it's afternoon now uh, in Manchester. Absolutely. Evening. Uh, well, well, there you are. Now, uh, very interesting presentation. Thank Lovely you. pictures. Um, I'm going to challenge you, though, a little bit, because I can tell you if I walk around that whole stand, everyone will show me pictures like you showed me. Of course. So my question is, I saw a lot of interesting stuff, but I saw very little evidence. 
when is that evidence, you talked about it, when is that evidence going to come through and what are you doing in terms of proper randomised controlled trials uh, and, if so, and possibly even blinded? When is that coming through and uh, are you involved in that? So several of the studies have already been completed and we have the, they, they actually, I'm sure they can even hand you a copy of it in the corner of the, if you go to the booth, they, we have several studies, I can send them to you, they can provide them for you. They've already conducted several to get this data, the data for the kill times, the bactericidal effects, that's all based on studies that they've completed already. That's not evidence. Yeah, but you, you know, let me, let me tell you, I think that, I, 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 I couldn't agree with you more actually, and, and I think there are a lot of technologies that are, uh, these, these, that, that exist solely because they exist. And I think sometimes um, companies take, it's natural, companies will take the, uh, the, the, they'll, they'll, it's like a race to the bottom. Um, and I will say, in, in defense of the folks here, I've seen the opposite uh, happening, and I think these folks are investing in, in studies that they don't necessarily have to do. But I think because of you, and because of, hopefully to a small extent, me, but you right now are doing this, our expectations are higher uh, than they were 10 years ago or 15 years ago. And you're raising the most, the most important philosophical thing, which is that we have to stop settling for uh, pretty pictures. Now, that's not what Sam showed. He was showing his actual clinical experience with the thing, and I think that was really valuable because I think there's a lot of tips and tricks there. But if you go out and you look at a you know, four-color picture of before and after, look at me, you know, you, sure, we all have that. Hopefully some of us have you know, thousands of those. Um, and it's a great feeling. But when you can compare that to, it, it, for me, this would be fascinating now to compare, uh, for instance, uh, it, one, one example would be maybe negative pressure wound therapy with uh, uh, hypochlorous versus saline, saline, or saline, if I want to translate for you. And, the, and then, uh, the, uh, but, but, the, but, the, but the point is that, and one could look at, uh, you know, uh, uh, time to discharge or length of stay in a hospital. Uh, one could take serial uh, uh, samples of the wound and look for uh, uh, re reductions or changes. I think we're going to hear more about that in the, in the microbiology section of our day-to-day -day changes in the, in the microbiology uh, profile. Uh, we could also look at another thing that would be really cool, and you touched on it in the beginning, uh, and, uh, and it would be uh, wound pH, because you know, there's, uh, there's actually pretty good evidence to suggest that if you can get someone into a lower pH range right. by whatever means necessary, then uh, one could reduce the, eff the, the efficiency of those proteolytic enzymes and increase the likelihood uh, for healing and possibly take for a graft. That would be cool to do. So these sorts of things could be done, but the trouble is that what they require is something extra on the part of companies and when a company is trying to decide whether they're going to hire more sales staff or they're going to, or they're going to invest in a study, which might cost a lot like many sales staff, and they already have an approved product, there's a perverse incentive. I, I mean, I think about it all the time, and I guess I would probably, if I, if I wanted to feed the, you know, my, 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 uh, the people in my company, keep, them, keep food on their table, I would probably do the latter. But I would like to think maybe um, if I was thinking about sustainability, maybe the former. Uh, Let so me come back to you on that. In the UK, very simple, if you can't convince me what you're doing is better, mm. then my managers are going to buy the cheapest product, full stop. Mm. Okay? So if you're going to convince me to change, you have to have evidence. And, you, and it's not criticizing you, but what I'm going to say to you now is that if you had the evidence, it would have been on your presentation. Now, I'm just being a bit pushy there, and I apologize for that. But if you had a randomized controlled trial which showed that this either speed up healing, reduced the amount of antibiotics you needed, etc., real clinical hard endpoints, then that's all you need to say. You could literally put that one slide up, walk away, and we'd all be running for, for the product. So until we get used to that level of evidence, we're, I mean, I don't know what it's like in the US, but I presume it's getting harder and harder to fund things. 
we're not going to make progress. And that's a paradigm shift, because pretty pictures are nice, but every one of those stands out there, and the people who haven't even come here will show you pretty pictures. This it doesn't cut it. You're, listen, you're, uh, you, in, in sorry, that, in the, no, what are you sorry for? You're, actually, stay up, because this is terrific. The, the, you, you appreciate, you're preaching to the converted, uh, and this would be no different than if we were talking about uh, orthopedics and uh, one screw versus another uh, that are phenomenally uh, expensive. Uh, why not just use an old AO or even a K-wire? Uh, and, uh, and where are the data there? In fact, they, some do not exist. Most do not exist. Uh, if we were looking at, uh, oh my God, if we were to go to a vascular meeting and look at uh, uh, one wire versus another, I think uh, there, now evidence is improving, but a lot of times you're looking at a lesion. Uh, that's why my Flomigo, Joe Mills, calls some people that just focus on angiograms lesionologists yeah. uh, and not looking at real outcomes like healing and things. But the, and those are orders of magnitude more expensive. Uh, and so the investment and the business model on that, I think, is completely different. And so what's a little bit subversive is that we're now seeing for things like this, you're seeing products which are really commodities um, having to show good evidence in order to become uh, the standard. Yeah. And I think that's what's happening now uh, with, uh, with this uh, uh, technology. And uh, I think for, for you, for me, for Sam, uh, perhaps we'll all uh, say to be continued. Absolutely. Yeah. There, I will just say there is some other stuff that their company is doing right now. I can't talk about it because they're still doing it. But... And there's there, is, there is additional data coming, is what I will say. And it's remarkable data from what I've seen so far. And there, uh, and, and there are some things that I know about, uh, but uh, I, I, I'd have to kill you. Uh, and, but, that, but more on that later, outside. In Stay tuned. Minutes. Yeah, just, the, oh, just the one more question is, uh, follow that question. Is, uh, I remember uh, when the drug Rab introduced to me about uh, this kind of hypochlorite asset solution. I use it. I, I got a good result, but I dig out the paper. I found that paper only in vitro assay, never have in vivo assay. So, and uh, if you show those, you know, you should show the, pic, uh, the reference, you know. And uh, I just want to ask you a personal experience. You're using that for the amino errant memory, and you suck them in that solution, and then you apply to the patient wound, and what's the, what's the outcome? Is it better than just using the saline suck, the, the epifix, or better using the hypochloride like you described? Have you follow up, see the, what's the result? I, anecdotally, it's all, I mean, we've only, the product's only been available for us for the last couple of months, so. Long-term data, we don't have any. It's purely based on anecdotal evidence and seeing these wounds stay clean. I've been very surprised with many of them, and that's why I put the pictures up there, because they're things that I did not expect to work out. I expected them to be very dirty, end up getting reinfected multiple times, and they ended up staying clean. So based on that purely right now, what, I am, what we are doing at the center is comparing my data with a couple of the other physicians' data who use it differently. They do not reconstitute with Pearson. So going forward, we will look at some of that data, but it's way too early for us to have actual physical data based on that. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, yeah, Steve Porter, representing many interests, but from a standpoint of a pharmacologic and microbiologic activity. That must make you very interesting. Yeah, it could just make it interesting, so to speak. So I look forward to an interesting question. <laughs> so here's the question, I guess. As an observation, this is a convoluted inverse logic situation here where we have a commoditized product that's non-reimbursable, and now we've got to justify its existence uh, in clear evidence, if you will, but anecdotal and case series. Right. It works very, very well. It has since the First World War. Okay, mm -hmm. so in various iterations, some of the distinctions are whether it has hypochlorite or bleach in combination with hypochlorous solution. Mm -hmm. No one wants to say hypochlorous acid anymore because the nurses think it burns the patient. Um, it doesn't. Uh, but the real issue here is what is the clinical efficacy through randomized controlled trials? Those are forthcoming. They're not evident. But we've got a world in our country 
where we have to justify the use of ethicon. I mean, we're down to that level of justification for utilization mm -hmm. for cost to justify their comparative efficacy against the standard. But there is evidence in the world of hypercooler solution where the uh, uh, prevention and, and diminution of exotoxins in fa necrotizing fasciitis right. has been not only limb saving but life saving. Mm -hmm. So it, the, acti the multifactorial activities, uh, multifaceted activities, if you will, of hypercore solution is anti inflammatory, anti cytokine, anti toxin, uh, promoting keratinocytes. All those are inferential in vitro, yes. some in vivo, but clinical evidence of survivability is forthcoming. Randomized trials are in play that will be in the next couple of years. Absolutely. Well, Thank there you we go. for that. There, I, I kind of commented on the anti-inflammatory effect very, very briefly. I mentioned it in a word, but I, I do some cosmetic work in one of my other offices. And on the skin resurfacing patients, they get a lot of erythema and inflammatory reaction for about two to three days after the procedures. Using now Puricin, they've cut back significantly. So I think that anti-inflammatory effect is a very important Thing to comment on. And commenting on, never shy from a comment, uh, Professor Gibbons. Well, one thing that we just have to be careful about, it's one thing if you don't get reimbursement, but if you can truly demonstrate value by, it, especially in the states where we're coming to population health, uh, and it is coming fast and furious, cost avoidance. So cost avoidance right. being, are you healing faster, are you getting them out, Getting them out of the stay. hospital and yeah. less yeah. cost with that, then clearly something will pay for itself. Just asking for your comments on that. Well, I, look, uh, you're, you're, uh, I, I couldn't agree with you more, like, like usual, by the way, uh, Professor. <laughs> but, but it's the trouble, the hard part, of course, with that. We don't, I mean, this is not the venue to talk about this. We're having these sort of Talmudic discussions of, up here about, uh, you know, companies and, and uh, the, you know, burn rates and commodities. But the fact is that, you know, these discussions that one has with uh, uh, various uh, 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 fiscal decision makers are, are always challenging because, mm -hmm. you know, their, their life expectancy in their job is, you know, you know, 18 plus or minus six months in their job, you know, their general ma their manager, they want to be VP or EVP or, some, or SVP or something, and then they want to be uh, president of a hospital. And so they're changing a lot, and so you get a lot of the head nodding like, you know, like, like this, and, and, or, uh, and then they, uh, it sort of goes away because it's, it's not a, there is a, I, I think there is a potential benefit in trying to talk about cost avoidance to these folks, mm -hmm. but the time horizon for them the people that are actually making these decisions is perversely too short for them to even experience anything that they can put, if I'm going to be cynical, uh, on, their, uh, on their resume uh, for their next, uh, the, the, their next job. So when you have to try to have them consider one of these things, it's, it's, it's more challenging than that, isn't it? God bless you, man. I, 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 uh, I, I could not agree more because you have technology like this that emanates from a, a really long provenance. I mean, this is, uh, you know, this is Alexis Carell, you know, the first Nobel Prize winning uh, uh, surgeon, and uh, uh, Henry Dakins uh, uh, made uh, 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 Dakin, it's now called Dakin Solution, but they made this, you know, they were neighbors in, in New York, and they, they made this uh, uh, for the First World War, and it was extraordinarily helpful. Uh, there were not good randomized controlled studies, but there was a lot less trench foot. Um, and, and uh, uh, it's existed and been modified since then, but it's been so inexpensive that no one's bothered to bothered to look at it. But that's the perverse thing about this: is you have something that's very inexpensive, but likely really, really useful. It's kind of like uh, things that are cheap, well, in vascular, almost nothing's cheap, but like a subintimal, a bolia su subintimal angioplasty, right? You can't sell a balloon there, but you know you can potentially make a difference. Uh, in, uh, uh, with, with an angioplasty, but it's, it's no, no one's going to try to do the big studies to, uh, to show that because there's no incentive. Hi, thank you for the talk, Song. I just wanted to ask you, you were comparing uh, saline to uh, puricin. I was wondering if you've ever used prontosan and what the comparisons are. The biguanide prontosan. I, I myself have not used uh, 
any other hypochlorous. We did use Vosh for a short period of time. But looking at the data, just looking on that slide, looking at the data between the concentration of hypochlorous versus hypochlorite, I gravitated towards Purison and have stuck with it because it, it's worked well for me. Thanks. Well, uh, we are 60 seconds over, and I apologize for that. Uh, but but this, was, uh, this was really terrific, and actually unexpectedly terrific uh, d uh, d uh, d uh, discussion as well. More on this later, and I think we'll uh, see the next chapter in the evolution of what was something that we used to always completely ignore. You know, a lot of people ignore the foot in general, uh, but within the foot, you know, we often ignore things like what we cleanse this, uh, the, the wound on the foot with. Well, here we go. Let's uh, wait for the next chapter, and hopefully we can keep making a difference for all of our patients. And I want to thank, uh, thank you. Dr. Sam. That was just absolutely terrific. Thank you, everybody. All right, you guys, stay tuned. It's going to be an awesome morning uh, with some mind-blowing gadgetry. And also, unfortunately, Dr. Mills.